with serious mental health illness has been a source of research and attention worldwide for, for approximately 20 years. A thorough review of this research is presented in summary by Dr. Wayne Hall entitled Cannabis Use and the Risk of Development and Psychotic Disorder, World Psychiatry 2008. Various research that has been done unambiguously agrees that the incidence of psychosis increases with cannabis use. This is especially concerning in adolescents and young, young adults. The symptoms of their illness are likely to be more severe and the treatment process longer. The path ahead of them in life is a difficult one indeed in requiring more hospitalization and other episodes of treatment. To understand better the patterns of substance abuse among patients treated here at New Hampshire <coughs> Hospital, we undertook a capital study of all patients admitted to New Hampshire Hospital for a six month period of time in 2012. We learned that approximately 1,000 admissions, one of four, had a positive toxicology result for cannabis use. For adolescent males, 13 to 20 year olds, 40% had a positive toxicology result. 76 were positive, 76 percent were positive for cannabis. Of adolescent females, 36 percent of those admitted had positive toxicology, toxicology result. Of those, 50, 53 were positive for marijuana. We conclude from this that marijuana use has a high association with severe, severe symptoms of mental illness, severe enough symptoms to require hospital level care. This is especially concerning with adolescents and young adults because the prognosis for recovery is much worse for people with symptoms of serious mental health illness and substance abuse problems. The future for young people diagnosed with serious psychotic disorders is a difficult future and the same is true for a young person diagnosed with substance abuse problems. For a teenager diagnosed with both substance abuse problem and serious mental health illness, he or she faces a dark, twisted path indeed. A widespread disbelief appears to exist among adolescents and adults as well. That cannabis is a benign drug. The association between cannabis use and serious mental health illness has been de demonstrated repeatedly. The results of our data reinforce this. Based on all data we collected and reviewed, we found that almost two thirds of our admissions had some history of substance use. Many admissions had a history of abuse of multiple substances. The substances most frequently abused for all ages are alcohol and marijuana. It may be that substance abuse worsens the psychiatric symptoms. It may be that psychiatric conditions makes the patient more vulnerable to substance abuse. It may be that both interact to worsen each other. But clearly, cannabis is not a benign or harmless drug for those with psychotic disorders. <coughs> Rather, cannabis use places them at risk for more aggravated symptoms a mental illness and worse prognosis for recovery, and it places them at much higher risk throughout their life of continued substance abuse. And I will submit this to you for your reading. Thank you very much. And I am done. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much. Our final um, person to testify is Tim Robertson, who, of course, could forego the opportunity to be with you. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure Mr. Representative Robertson will be brief. Oh, sure. Is he speaking on all three bills or just this one? <laughs> 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 He's only on this one. I want to thank everyone for their presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. Uh, I've been listening, and there's certainly have been a lot of temptations to ask questions. Uh, one of the problems has always been we use wrong words. Uh, for instance, the amount of marijuana that you smoke, you get to a point where you're high. You can't go any higher on marijuana. There are only so many receptors in the human brain that react to THC. And after you get there, you're as high as you're going to get. Now, if it's stronger marijuana, you'll get there quicker but you don't go to the point where on alcohol you can drink yourself dead. I had an employee who had a problem. I took him, drove him to the local alcohol abuse, and he blew, I think it was a 0.8. Sure. 
and uh, they said a little bit beyond that, and uh, you know, you wouldn't have got him here because he'd have been dead. Uh, and he certainly, within a year, was dead. Uh, I don't know what he died of, but I think it was acute alcohol poison. A couple other things. Well, and, and one of the problems there is we use the same words with alcohol, stone. Well, we all know people on alcohol who have been stoned. Well, you don't, they can't walk, they can't talk. Uh, if you're an attractive female near them, they might grab you. That's not what marijuana does to you. It doesn't make you a better person, but it doesn't uh, keep you from walking, talking, or and, and to throw in something and you're not going to be able to find it because car and driver now denies they ever did it, but uh, they quite often hire racetracks and go test automobiles. That's what the car and driver does. They decided they would find out if marijuana impaired your driving. They found out two things. They went out with two or three different cars, two or three different drivers, and drove as fast as they could on the track. Took their time. Then they went back to their trailer, which they have there where they do their writing, and smoked marijuana. They went back out on the track, and their times improved. Now, they also found out that it was not a good idea to drive, <coughs> because one of the things that marijuana does to you is it sharpens what you see and hear. Colors became brighter, shapes became more alert. You saw things out of the corner of your eyes. What the heck was that? Well, you know as well as I do, it's not a good idea to be distracted when you're driving. So they didn't recommend you smoke and drive. Uh, research was done in England, where it's one of the universities. We've got a few. Uh, marijuana users to volunteer to let themselves be escorted followed. They found that on average, the marijuana smoker, when he was smoking, avoided driving if he could. It doesn't kill your moral or ethical senses. And they found that when he was forced to drive, he drove on average of 10 to 15 miles an hour slower. Now, I would like some of you to explain why, if marijuana and drugs have nothing to do with it, why we have 25% of the world's prison population with only 5% of the world's population. Everybody says, well, marijuana, you know, it's a, you know, it's no crime and they're not in jail for that. Well, I have a relative who was sitting in the back seat of a car with three of her fellow uh, college mates, and they were stopped for, uh, you know, kind of go, not quite complete stopping at a stop sign in the middle of Vermont, and uh, I guess the officer thought he detected some odor, and she, not knowing that her friends were carrying her aunt marijuana, was arrested for being in the presence of a transporter had to hire a lawyer, was threatened with jail time for being in the present. Now, I don't know how much the other student had in his pocket, but when people keep telling me that you don't go to jail for marijuana, and yet every night I read in the paper, there are two or three dozen arrests for possession. Now, I assume they probably don't go to jail for just possession on their first sight. But do they on the second, or do they if they're carrying a little more? You know, would I send you to jail if you had a carton of cigarettes? Or would I send you if you only had one pack? You know, you're not going to smoke the case immediately, or even the pack immediately. You're going to smoke one at a time. And if I have a pound of marijuana, it doesn't mean I'm going to smoke a pound today. I'm going to smoke a couple ounces, maybe. I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, I've been listening to you. Sorry. And 
We have two more bills to go. I understand that, but I've heard a lot of things today that well, we're not quite true. And if we truly believe outlawing things makes this a better world and country, the biggest, most addictive drug and killer of Americans is tobacco. Now, through education and advertising, we are stopping cigarettes. Alcohol, the second biggest problem. We send them and they go to AA. My church has uh, probably seven, eight, or nine AA meetings a week. Do they have one for marijuana? They can't because if a person came to an anti-marijuana, the police might sit outside and say, whoa, whoa I'm going to follow this guy because he can arrest them. Or could he get help if he's a cocaine addict or a heroin addict? No, he doesn't dare go to the shrink or anybody else to get help because, geez, an undercover guy might just sit outside the shrink's office, take down names and number plates. Tomorrow, I can put him in jail because he must have a supplier, so I'll just follow him. So it discourages people to get help when they do have problems. And you know, it used to be legal in the state of New Hampshire for a town to vote itself dry after prohibition ended. When I was a kid in the 40s, a town with a town meeting not to allow any alcohol in the town. And try to find me a town in New Hampshire today who's dry. It just didn't. There are two dry towns <coughs> by law local or by accident. No, local options still. Yeah. Well, it, it didn't work. And, you know, I'll take questions, but. I know you won't. <laughs> 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 I put a card in earlier, and my name wasn't called. What, what is your name? Uh, Al. 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 Is that your real name? You're an organized crime on the bottom of I'm here to speak on behalf of New Hampshire Organized Crime. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, well, you have time.